No promises. You, some of you may have questions. If I don't know the answer, I will completely make something up that dozens of people in the industry will come chasing me down for later. But they'll be good answers. That's all I can say. Um, whoops, that's not it. Did I click on the wrong one? This is the wrong one. Don't go. Ah, there we are. Okay, let's try this again. Uh, pretending none of that ever happened, we'll start right off. My name is Brian Colon. I'm a game designer, artist, animator, filmmaker, um, and that's actually all in the reverse order. I, my company is Game Refuge, but long before that, I fell into a company that you may have heard of called Bally Midway. And before that, I was a college student making films, and I'm going to get into the film industry. And I made a number of films in high school, and uh, it was great, you know. All your friends show up, you get these things cranked out, and you get to college where it costs money, and it's 16 millimeter film, and you got to send it away, and it comes back, and you see the mistakes, and you got to do it over. So I could draw. So I made some animated films. Won international awards for it. It was great. It was wonderful. And, um, whoops, what the heck? This is obviously going to be, there we go. And so in college, I started doing ads for local bars and stuff like that with my, to raise money to make my films. And I would work, you know, and it, it was a good ad agency. Basically, I worked for beer and peanuts and that kind of stuff. And out of college, I, saw an ad one day, because I'm still making just beer and peanuts, uh, doing my advertising work, and uh, I saw an ad for the Bally Midway Company. And they wanted, and I'm thinking, pinball, cool. I'm an artist, I can do that too. And they wanted an animator. And my international award-winning animated film did really well, but why would, ba oh, I got it. They need someone to paint on the back of black back glasses. I can do that. I go down there. And George Gomez, who's still in the industry, but back then he was uh, kind of the heart and soul of their brand new development group. And he said, no, we, need, we saw your film. We, want, we need an animator for video games. And I said, really? People do that? Pac-Man? You need an animator? And he said, yes, and we've seen your thing. We're very impressed. And, uh, you know, and I said, you know, I, I got to warn you, because I was not really, I was a pinball guy back in my youth. And video games, you know, I played Pong, and that was it. it was really, so I said, you know, I got to warn you. I, uh, I, um, I have a successful ad agency. I make $300 a month. George is like, I think we can do a little better than that. So before I, and I called a friend, I was actually, and this won my award-winning film, but uh, I called her, you know, I got the phone call from George while I was at a, a wedding, and I turned to my friends around me, and I tried to make a joke out of it, and I choked up. I said, well, that's it. I can't turn that money down. You know, childhood's over. I got a real job. And man, was I wrong. It has never been anything like a real job, and Childhood has never been over. The first thing I fell backwards into was doing the animation for Discs of Tron. Uh, the, what, they wanted more realistic stuff, and the programmer on that was really a perfectionist. I mean, if I got one of those circles two pixels off, he's telling me about it. And animated films takes weeks just be drawing it, filming it, sending it out, getting it back. Here, I'm doing it in the morning, and I'm seeing it in the game in the afternoon. I was hooked. Dis of Tron, there's Bob Dinnerman. Dis of Tron was uh, something I had, I'd seen Pac-Man. This thing is a full 3D, if you know the environmental especially, that full D 3D experience. Wow, I'm falling in love with this. I mean, right away, I, I knew I was wrong. And, even within weeks of me being there, it would, folks, it was a wild west. It was 1982. 
management was in a separate building. We were in a little cramped building and they left us alone. So when we're seeing that this one game called Mothership is doing terrible on tests, I did some little cartoony guys. And I said to the programmer, I said, hey, what if we uh, use that? He, no problem, let's do it. Turned it around, it became Cosmic Cruiser. Management liked the little Cosmic Cruiser guy so much, they had an out of house thing, put him in their new game, Wacko, which actually came out first. So Cosmic Cruiser was my first, and again, that would never happen in corporations today and in the world today. Cosmic Cruiser was uh, probably the first game where of mine after Disavtron that was released, but I wasn't I wasn't the designer on that one. I was um, I was just you know the artist, but they let me reskin it, which is would have been unheard of. I saw a game in, in a pile of uh, one sheet game descriptions that we were going through. Sharon, my mentor, the gal who put the bow on Ms. Pac-Man. She's like, yeah, this is where we've got game ideas. I said, why are we doing this one? This is like a battle game. This would be so cool. And it's like, it's ants, Brian. They don't want to do it. And I said, we'll make them cartoony. So uh, you can see from, that was the test header for, because for me, it was everything. I, as a kid, I, I always played the uh, Risk or these things where you had the little cardboard pieces and you had to set up the board for four hours just to get another three hours of play and then you're still, it's like, we can do it all. We can do it all in a video game. They hired a programmer. I just mentioned it offhand. They hired a programmer. Unfortunately, he left. We got a great two-player game out of it, but out in the arcades, it had to be two players. So it didn't test well enough. It never got released. Uh, play, it was basically two hives of ants are, um, um, fighting over garbage in a garbage dump. It was a lot of fun. But right after that, I'm working on Spy Hunter. I should say what right after that. One of the beauty of being an animator and being hired as an animator is you worked on everything. There were two or three or four of us at different times, but I'm doing this on this, and you see he's doing this, and Spy well, I'm going to back that up real quick. Is this a, Spy Hunter, we all worked on, we all contributed to the design. The pro, programmer on that was very receptive. And, hey, let's add a water rack. Well, we don't, let's redo the whole game again. And the whole second half of Spy Hunter was myself and a buddy of mine that I got hired. And we were all having fun. It was Wild West. Management left us alone. And then one day they came in while we're at the end of Spy Hunter and said, here's your engineering notebook. Every idea you have has to be cross-referenced by every other witness in the room, and you have to sign it at the bottom, and you have to pre put that in so to make sure that Bally knows we own everything that management, corporate, starting to get where they were. Um, I don't know that you can see those, but things like uh, the Rush Hour Avenger, Classification Dull, uh, Detour de Force, I got a Start Key and Clutch, Dukes of Tron. We had a ball with those books the first day. We came up with about 50 of the worst names, you'd, uh, you know, Hershey Highway. Um, and then we've never used them again. They never, they all got put away, they never got used again. That was, uh, for a while it was called Battle Scars. And that was a concept art that I did for Battle Scars. But it eventually, fortunately, the marketing department decided to call it Spy Hunter, which was the right name. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then the other thing about as uh, in those early days, no one was a designer. You're an animator, you're a programmer, you're a sound engineer, you're a mechanical engineer. We were all coming up with the ideas, but no one was a designer. So we had to hide our initials in the cabinet art. So if you ever look at a uh, uh, spy hunter, that's all our, that engine is a Leone engine, because Tom Leone and mine are BC missiles that are coming out of the thing. That was the water rack on the sit down, the, the back uh, header. We call them header, everybody in the industry calls them marquees. But at Bally, we call them headers. That was because of the water rack we, we came up with. All right, enough on Spy Hunter. Moving along, working on everything. Demolition Derby, fun game, uh, four-player upright, and then a four-player uh, cock four player cocktail. Um, first game I ever I worked on that, it was Sharon and uh, Jeff Nauman, a programmer, working on that. He started around the same time I did. And it was an old, you know, just a nice, very, simple as they were back then hardware was not much 
Very simple, very fun, and I helped out on that, although mainly what, <laughs> mainly what I did on this game was the girls, and because uh, that was just a little more fun to me work, to work on than cars. I gravitate more towards the human form, especially human form that looks like that. Um, next game I worked on, Jeff wanted to do a, a, a tank game, and I th said, okay, let's do it, let's make it comic. Like we came up with things like, okay, the players can be cooperative, or they can fight against each other, or they can fight against the, the AI, which would try and kill them both. So that was kind of new. And I still love that ant raid idea. So I said, let's make it so that you're controlling two vehicles, not just one. You can run from the tank. You can run over to the helicopter. So that did very well. We did an uh, upright and a uh, cocktail. Well, I say cocktail. It was four feet tall, but of that as well. And that was Sarge. And, well, and again, yes, there are truths to the rumors that in between rounds, our tank girl, in a test version, uh, Jeff and I had a dip switch for just ourselves that made it into the first run. So, <laughs> uh, but actually, no, forget that. It's, it's a total fake uh, lie. Uh, yeah, don't mention it to anybody. But if they have a Sarge, go look for it. Swackery was uh, a milestone for me for a couple of reasons. Uh, it was, I used a big character by combining sprites. I did a Dungeons and Dragons game. I worked with Tracy Hickman up at uh, uh, TSR, the guys who were doing Dungeons and Dragons. Came up with this game where you scroll off one way, you come in another way. It's you're swinging swords, you're casting spells, you're finding things and figuring out where to use them elsewhere. We had a, I had a ball with that. Um, and the, that header up there is a remake that I did for Doc Mac at the Galloping Ghost. The original, uh, the, the original didn't have that cartoony wizard up there, but later we redid it. But that was Zwackery. And the really cool thing for me about Zwackery is they never called anybody designers, as I told you. They're showing Nolan Bushnell through the offices. It was around the time we were starting to deal stuff with guys on the West Coast. And, and that, was a write, that was a typical write-up in those days. Write-ups were game design documents were cocktail napkins as often as anything else. They're showing Nolan Bush, now this is about to go out on test. We're all the way done with the game. And management comes in and this is our new game, Zwackery. And this is the designer, Brian Colin. I ran out and changed my business cards the very next day. I, it, it was delightful. The, oh, shoot. Hit the wrong button again. Um, where's my mouse? Let's go there. OK. Um, and then, of course, then Nolan made an offhand comment. Hey, you know what you could do with this is this? No! Every every head on every cubicle on the floor looked up to see what was Brian yelling at Nolan Bushnell about now. He was great. We talked about it. And basically, I said, this game is almost on test. And with your clout, management's going to make me start all over. They, he's like, I'll explain it to him. Don't worry. He was wonderful. So that was Zwackery. And Zwackery was my first game as an official designer. The next one, they, uh, they wanted a track and field feel game. So we came up with something where you're a giant pterodactyl running along across the ground, eating watermelons. Then you leap into the air, and then you've got to flap to stay in the air. So, and on, ba on your back is a boomerang, boomerang throwing, half-naked, uh, fur-clad cave woman who's throwing boomerangs at these, and you're shooting watermelon seeds at giant invisible killer bees. Didn't do all that well. I'm not sure. Um, perhaps it was just a little too far out there. Also, we were counting on the fact that we needed more art. That's why the bees were invisible, um, except at very close ranges. And management said, no, well, let's see how it tests without it. So that one never happened. You'll never play that game. Some of these games. Uh, but test versions that weren't released are right, at Gallop and Ghost, though. I donated all my old test kits to, and around that same time. And, sorry, I had to pause. Around that same time, I, 
I, uh, Laserdisc games are coming out, and Astron Belt was terrible. It was paper mache mountains with a little, little rocket flying over it. And I'm a filmmaker. I said, we can do this. So I went to head of engineering. I said, look. I can make a film that's a kind of choose your own adventure, live action. I can do this for next to nothing. And to my amazement, OK. They, they didn't pay for actors. They paid for film and equipment. And by putting an ad out in the paper, literally in the Chicago Sun-Times, it said, vampires wanted, no experience necessary. We had hundreds show up that we the, oh, and that's Sharon Perry. She doesn't look quite as good there. She had, that's the girl that uh, my mentor, when I first got hired, the uh, Bally Midway artist. And uh, uh, she put the bow on Ms. Pac-Man, I think I said before. So this thing, we sh worked on it for about three months in a building. It, oh, we, did, we're be able to, we were able to get a building real cheap downtown because it was slated for destruction. It was a 13-story former insane asylum with electricity, but no heat, in the literally, still to this day, coldest February on record. We were in there shooting one day, and one of my uh, student uh, assistants uh, that I, you know, working cheap, cut. Wait a minute, wait, that's my job. What do you mean, cut? He's like, Brian, it's snowing. I said, I know it's snowing. We're inside. He's like, Brian, it's snowing. Turns out, and I look up, and it was in this building. Our breath from condensation is freezing on the ceiling. The, as soon as we click on the hot lights up top, it melts, starts falling to the ground, and it was so freaking cold, it turned back into snow on the way down. If you play Deathstalker, well, anyway, it didn't get released. By the time we got done, um, Management had got out of the laser disc industry because, as some of you may remember, they did a game called NFL, but to save money, they did it on a video disc rather than a laser disc. And a video disc has a needle. So the first time the game got bumped, it turned into a $4,000 doorstop. And so they backed gently out of And so this sat in the can for 30 years until Doc Mack over at the Gallup and Go said, you've still got the film? It's like, yeah, he's like, let's restore it. It's like, well, it was never a game. He's like, Brian, you're still making games. So it came out about five years ago. Doc Mac sold them as arcade games, and he also has it on Steam now. So, okay, I'm going to move on from that to the one that everybody, what I'm best known for is Rampage. Rampage was a game that I was at a trade show, saw a bunch of stuff with animating backgrounds and big characters. I want to do that. Why can't we do that? So marketing guy and a sound engineer and Sharon and I are in a room and they're all, they've all been there longer than me. And it's like, Brian, we can't. It's like, but we, Brian, we can't. But uh, Brian, all you can do with this hardware is move a rectangle. What are you going to do with a moving rectangle? Looked at Sharon and I said, okay. Building collapsing into itself is a moving rectangle. What knocks down buildings but giant monsters? P went and pulled Jeff Nauman, uh, who I'd worked with several times before, in and said, how? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can yep, 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 yep. We got it. First line of the, the design document, which we were actually typing by that point because uh, management was a little more advanced. Oh, and by the way, side note, the humans in this, that's uh, Brian at the top, my wife Ray in the middle, and Jeff Nauman at the bottom. Uh, and we took it to our boss, and of course he said, no. So I went over his head, uh, the, you know, went up to the head of engineering who was nice enough to give me the money for the other, th oh, and that's, that's the design team uh, back in the day. Uh, uh, Mikey Bartlow, Sharon Barr Perry, Jim Belt, Jeff Nauman, and I. So I took it to head of engineering who gave me the money. It's like, oh, I love it. Great. Yeah, no, this is fun. This is hysterical, blah, 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 blah. But we got to change everything because you can't be the bad guy. You can't eat people. You can't fight the cops. You can't. So I went to the top three guys, Dave Morosky and Hank Ross and Stan Jarocki, and no, no, no. Jeff and I started on it anyway. Oh, there it is, Psychology of a Rampage, or why this is next year's number one game. I mean, we knew. And... Uh, 
by an amazing coincidence, the top three were fired the next week. And the new guy coming in, a guy named Maury Furchin, who came from retail, who turned around the Montgomery Ward's retail store, if you're old enough to remember that, sent out a memo and says, don't worry, everybody's job is safe. We're going to do things as normal. You know, I, I'm coming in. I start Monday. I've got an open door policy. You can guess who is waiting outside his door at 8.59, his first day. He t the first meeting was with me. He green-lighted it, and the rest, as they say, is history. That game broke every earnings record in the country. And then marketing, marketing was kind of fun because it's like we put, if you remember the game, we put cities' names all over the country. I went to marketing. I said, now, what? We, you know, what we can do is send to newspapers and TV stations that your town is about to be destroyed. And they can, and of course, marketing said no. So I wrote back in the days when writing was still licking stamps, th well, hun not thousands, but over a thousand letters that generated hundreds upon hundreds of articles around the country. So um, we had a ball with it. It was a great game. Uh, we, we had fun, and it got ported to lots and lots of home systems back in the day. Um, yeah. And then these are little newer things that people continually ask me to do commissions or I do them for other stuff. And my very next game was Xenophobe. Xenophobe had the greatest cabinet I've ever had the pleasure of putting a game in. That was a, 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 a cabinet guy, John Kubik. Um, Three-player game, but you each had your own little horizontal screen, and you could all spread out to destroy all the aliens in a spaceship before it blew up. And like uh, Zwackery, you could find things and put them here and put them there, and they would uh, let you turn things off and turn the timer off or increase stuff and blow stuff up early. Um, unfortunately, the, and this is a sad story, um, if you come up by my booth today and we can look at the um, shadow boxes that Artivision puts out, it's actually got elements in there that you won't ever find in the game because the game was about three quarters of the way done. There were still dozens of things that had to happen. It made so much money on its early test that management said, let's just release it now. And it was a new programmer working on it with me and he wasn't willing to fight for it because he wanted to be a pinball. Here's a pinball note for all the pinball expo. He wanted to be a pinball designer or pinball programmer. So it just went out as is. But yeah, if you ever look at the ROM set, you will see a lot of cool stuff like spacesuits and, well, anyway, fun stuff. Again, uh, a lot of bad puns. There's a lot of characters in this game to choose from. All of them are bad puns. I, I take full responsibility for every bad pun you're ever going to see in any game of mine. Okay. Um, Venusian army knife there. Okay. And again, Xenophobe had a lot of points. And oh, this brings me up to the best thing about the arcade games that you don't get anywhere anymore is field testing. Now, this is at a recent trade show, but basically there was nothing better. We stayed, we made every game on schedule, on budget, when I was working for Bally Midway, because our friends down in, the, you know, down in the factory would get laid off if something was late. So literally, you know, we, we got it out there, we got it on test, and test was the best. You are standing there, you are seeing real people using their real money, putting it in, what makes them angry, what makes them smile, what makes them put in that next quarter? What can we do to make you put it in faster? There was nothing better than standing in a dark room watching little children. No, there's got to be a better way to say that. Um, just to watch the smiles on the players' faces was wonderful. Um, after the arcade days were over and we formed our own company, we're doing games for EA and 3DO and American Laser. And, uh, but reports don't do it. If this was the best time, which I'm so glad to see that arcades are crawling back now, uh, free play or not. This is what I want to see as a game developer. I want to see the look on their faces. Um, okay. Deathstalker. I'm bringing that back up now because, oh, well, I already mentioned, Doc Mac had me do it. It came back. He tells me that is is the 
number one game in his arcade every day of the week, 365 days a year, because people get on it in the morning and they play till closing. And again, this is, these are still testing pictures. But, and part of that is, I'm so glad it happened this way because if I had released it back when it did, it played way too long. It would have never made the money, not on a quarter. I would have had to charge a buck, which back then nobody would have touched. It would have never got released. At least this way, he actually built the game. He released them as an arcade game. It's available on Steam. And it's, I mean, as a filmmaker and a, you know, screenwriter and all that good stuff, it's terrible. It is just awful, but it's awful in a kind of mystery science theater sort of way so that you, you are looking at it going, oh, God, you know, bad puns. You know, the main bad guy is uh, Count Yorchikunsky. And, of course, uh, his nemesis who lives in Durhatchet Manor, the lunatic asylum it all happens in. You're looking for Buffy McGuffin. Alfred Hitchcock fans know who that is. Uh, so Buffy McGuffin, you're looking for your private detective. And, uh, yeah, Baron Durhatchet. Uh, you might see him, and it's a multi-path thing. You can get through this game dozens of ways, and what you pick up, you can defeat the guy at the end. And it's not a game like Dragon's Lair where you stop, you lose, you start over. It's a game where every time it's a full event. You get knocked out, you wake up somewhere else. You get knocked out, you wake somewhere else. And then you finally get to the end where you defeat him or not. And if you visit Count, uh, if you visit Count Yorchikunsky after you've seen Baron Hatchet. Count Yorchikunsky will tell you, never count, oh no, <laughs> always count Yorchikunsky before Der Hatchet. I know, I'm sorry, it's just who I am. A um, couple more games real quick. Okay, we're going from this. That's American International Team Laser. We, Jeff and I had two months to put it together for a European show. It did not do well. So we took that and we turned it into the game called Blasted that did much better. It's just laser tag out a window where you're shooting anything and everybody in the opposite uh, apartment building. It did pretty well. A lot of, it's still got a lot of fans. Oh, and there are uh, two professional actors and actresses um, who I used for, actually that's me and my wife, um, for Blasted Side Art, just a little background in the, Max RPM, uh, uh, programmer Gary o Oglesby uh, wanted to do a game where you actually had to use a clutch, a driving game where you use the clutch, so it was just a straight out, straight away. That was Max RPM. It did okay. It was, it got released anyway. Um, after that, uh, the new manager, because management now middle management's creeping in, was the former programmer from Spy Hunter, and he wanted to do Spy Hunter 2, but they w wouldn't redo that old hardware. They wouldn't. He we didn't want to wait for any new hardware, so we did Spy Hunter 2 on the Max RPM hardware, which I still consider it's kind of an embarrassment. It's it's not a it's. It's not a really good game. Everybody that he asked to work on it said no. They'd rather work on something else. So the team, team, you've got to have a team on the design side. If the team isn't pulling together, if the team isn't excited, the game may get done. But it's never going to be the, ki the kind of game that happens when um, everybody pulls together. This is a shot of everybody waving a salute because we were suddenly bought out by our biggest rivals, Williams Electronics. Williams bought Bally Midway when Jeff and I, Jeff Nauman again, were halfway through Arch Rivals. Jeff comes into my office one day, throws an uh, airplane barf bag down on the table and says, Brian, I've got it. It's like, I don't want to catch it, whatever it is. He says, no, no, no. And he wrote down on there, I always wanted to do controlling multiple characters. He said, this will let us do basketball the way it needs to be done, not just arbitrar arbitrary percentages based on the programmers. We can do a, you can call for a pass, you can pass, you can do a pick and roll, you can, and I'm, I'm stopping you. Jeff, you're 6'2". I'm 5'9". I don't know from a pick and roll, but it looks like a great game. It looks like it'd be fun, but for guys like me that don't love basketball, I want a foul. So that's why in Arch Rivals, 
if the, you can't get the guy the, uh, the ball away from the guy any other way, you punch him in the face. You pull down his pants. You jump on him and roll and trip him. We had a ball with that. That was another great high-earning game. Um, and it introduced a game mechanic that you may recognize from some later basketball games that Williams did. Uh, after Jeff and I left the company, um, we were approached to do a, um, something like they were doing at Williams, which was NARC and, other, and Mortal Kombat, where they were videotaping actors. And, then, and we said no. It's like, I, I want to do cartoon characters. And that was probably a big mistake because that one turned into NBA Jam. <laughs> so, but we were working, because, uh, um, but that, I skipped ahead there. We were still working for Bally Midway Williams. After our trials, we wanted to do a football game. They said, no, we're already working on one. So we did Pigskin. Pigskin went out. It tested great. It was wonderful. And then and here's, they say you learn from your mistakes. Here's a valuable lesson. You're in going into production next week. And you think of a way to increase earnings by saying, hey, if you buy the full game all at once, it's going to cost you two tokens less because it's four quarters or four periods, I should say, to play the game. People are going to love this. He, you put it in the game, and the game goes out, and it's earning like this, and it goes, and then it earns like this, and then it earns like this. We introduced a bug in which when somebody bought in, if you bought into a full player game, the game would play free for the rest of the day. We got new ROMs out, but by, by that time, the word in the industry got out that it was an iffy game, so it never sold as many as, our, uh, as arch rivals. A um, lot of fans for it. We did, a, we did a, I always wanted to do marketing stuff. Rampage, arch rivals, we did let operators change the names of the teams and do their high school colors. This one, we had jerseys and hats and uh, uh, playbooks and everything else. That was pigskin. Pigskin was fun to do. Oh, and, the whole, and, and like a lot of our games, home ports, I never understood Jerry Glanville's pigskin foot brawl uh, that Razor saw. But again, I wasn't following sports, so I didn't know who he was. But uh, that's, so I like just to see that. Okay. That was our time at Bally Midway and Bally Midway Williams. We formed about, for about a year, EA had been asking me to come work for him. I kept saying, no, I love California, but I can't afford to live there. Oh, we'll give you a bonus to move out here. It's like, I have an acre. Can I get an acre in Silicon Valley with the money you want to give me for, no. So we went back and forth. Finally, they said, all right, Brian, what if we just gave you enough money to start your own company? I could do that. <laughs> Not that I'm qualified, but that was Jeff and I when we formed Game Refuge. And our first game for EA was their highest earning original title the day, year it was released. It was called General Chaos. Jeff and I left Midway under good terms. We got on a train. We drove out there. I've been taking trains for a while now for certain reasons. And Jeff went with me for the first time. He brought one cassette tape that he turned over in Naperville and... 30 minutes after Naples, he's like, 35 more hours of this. So he's always flown everywhere. We got out there, we pitched him general chaos because we hadn't told him anything we wanted to do. The meeting went well. One exec said, hey, why don't we make it street gangs? And I said, no, absolutely not. Jeff's giving me one of these. I said, I got kids. I want my kids playing something that's obviously fantasy. I don't care how cartoon violent it is. I don't want street games. Pause breath okay we can see that so thank we made it through that first meeting we did this with uh with uh ea we started on a couple sequels we a sequel to general chaos and this one which was called plunder in which uh you uh were one side another two-player game one guy controlled all the undead the other guy controlled all the explorers both of them got pulled because ea decided they wanted to get into the arcade business all right I'm going to pause and take a breath here, uh, and that didn't work out too well for him, as some of you may remember. Okay. We, went, we were doing a game for uh, the new Midway, 
and uh, as an outside consultant, and they said, and we've got our 14-year-old male covered. We've got everything they want, but we need something that older people will play, younger people will play. And finally, Jeff and I looked at each other and said, let's redo Rampage. They got on board. Joe Dillon loved the idea. We, uh, we had, had a, a good staff by then. We had about five programmers. We had however many they are. Uh, does that look like eight? Yeah, eight animators plus myself. We did Rampage World Tour, and the beauty of that was the hardware was powerful. We could do what we want, and we had talked to, by this time we had a reputation, so guys from magazines were calling us saying, you got to put secrets in, so we can do secrets inside. This thing is full of secrets. It has uh, Area 51 in it, a cartoon version, of course. Uh, we had homages to RoboCop. We had uh, that warehouse where Indiana Jones stores the Lost Ark. You can go to hell in Rampage World Tour and eat Hitler. So, I mean, we did everything we could. There, there's a page that's almost, or a booklet that's almost 20 pages deep of all the secrets in this game. So we had a ball with that. Rampage, then this version of Rampage really took off. It got ported to everything at the time. Um, most of the, um, yeah, I have to say younger. I'm 68 years old. Most of the young kids, and that includes anybody under 50, um, remember Rampage World Tour probably more than Rampage. Uh, oh, word of advice. When you're promoting your new game and you're going out there in costume and you're going to a demo derby, don't pay, paint your car to look like the best car. Because every other car immediately descends. I think we were out in 45 seconds on that particular day. So uh, there's just a little marketing advice there. Rampage World Tour, again, get commissions all the time. What else can we do? We did merit touchscreen games. We went to Williams first, and they said no, because we wanted to do kind of virtual 3D. We did uh, four games for them, their, and their uh, royalty system was based on how much your game got paid, uh, played. That was great. We, <laughs> unfortunately, the other people that made games for them weren't very happy by the end of the first year. They sold a ton more the year we did that. And um, so they had to restructure their royalty program because we were getting too much play. That's why you got to read contracts. We, and then we went into, we stumbled into the gaming industry. And you know what? I don't know how much anybody wants to know what game ref I've been st I'm still making games. I've been doing games for 40 years. They got into the casino games. We got into, um, oh, this is an arcade. So we did this one. We were approached by the people at a Paramount license. We did Star Trek Voyager. Paramount was great. They let us uh, add our own characters. This was the capsule that was huge. It was in like almost every movie theater in the, like 2006, everywhere in the country. All our, it was wonderful. Great team, all modelers. Um, and I'm out there at Paramount. We're walking through one of the darkened sets, myself, the producer, and one of my animators. And, uh, oh, this is cool, this is neat. Well, you because know, I was out there getting research stuff. And all of a sudden, what the hell are you guys doing in here? comes around the corner chomping on a little butt of a cigar. You don't belong here. My producer, literally, big guy, he turns around and stands there. I'm going like Ralph Cram Cramden. Hamina, 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 hamina. My animator, Ben, God bless him. He's a big Trekkie. LeVar Burton. I loved episode one, blah, 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 where you had the blah, 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 and the, you made the, this thing had such a beautiful. And all of a sudden, angry cigar chomping LeVar Burton turns into reading rainbow. The nicest, sweetest guy he's showing us all around. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. But that was, that was the fun of Star Trek Voyager. Um, let's see. We did a lot of, oh, here's, you know what? Okay, one other aspect of what we've been doing for 40 years is commercial stuff. For the Komatsu, who makes those big rig things, they asked us to do a, a thing for a trade show where the, we would drive their trucks, their 40-ton pickup, pickup trucks, 
uh, mining trucks in a race, but we had a couple conditions. They couldn't go more than four miles an hour, and they couldn't touch each other. So we start on the game, and we're doing what we're doing. And I, okay, first, th first thing, would you mind if we go downhill? Oh, no, that's no problem. Cool. I think we've solved the speed problem. And then later, it w and then, well, I'll tell you this in a second. But, and then later, towards, as we're getting to the edge, it's like, I got to ask, why don't you want the tr t trucks to touch each other? Well, we don't want the paint to scratch. I said, I think we can handle that. We did a game where you go down a mountain. By the end, you are going about 150 miles an hour in 40-ton pickup trucks, and you're doing loop flips in the air as you're going over ramps. The whole thing was to try. Not only did you have to try to get win the race, you had to lose the least amount of load, so collisions made you lose. And you could go any, at least from the player's perspective, you could stay on the road. You could go over hills and mountains. You could... Um, because early on, one of the other conditions was, and you should know that our audience um, will have a drink in one hand, they don't play video games, and a cigarette in the other, or a girl on their lap. That's a creative challenge for making a video game. So basically, they don't know it, but if they go off anywhere we don't want, we gently steer them back onto the course, or we gently steer them to a secret thing over. Uh, it was, and it's one of my finest, design challenges that I'm so proud of, totally idiot proof. And they had a ball. They ran it for 11 years at their, every three years or every four years they had a convention. They ran it every year and the crowds only got bigger. I've had people working on construction in my neighborhood that you're the guy who, and it's like, you're not you're the guy, you, you did that game, we play that every year. That was very gratifying. The lines were 300 people long, long, and as you saw from some of those earlier things, up top they could watch. It was, you know, it was like TV, live TV coverage, and we put all of their other vehicles that you weren't racing in the background. So that's what you do when you're doing commercial stuff, and it can be just as much fun. This one was a bit, this one was, um, how do you describe it? One, probably the first and only game we have ever done on our own dime. It is full contact poker on heavily armed rocket powered snowmobiles in a perpetual winter in a Cthulhu mythos reality where you can cast spells and bring up demons that will, yeah, uh, not demons, you bring up the, the main god of this mythos, Cthundite. Sorry, I know, bad puns. Um, anyway, it only sold about 95,000 copies, but it is, it's a flipping riot. And at this point, at this point, I'm going to kind of stop. We've got, kind of stop? We've got 15 minutes left. Um, I will plug General Chaos 2. 30 years later, I started it. Um, as I started my uh, round, the, round the country uh, podcast tour, with uh, the indoor kids, uh, Kumal and his wife, I found out I had cancer. And when my main, our main client at that time found out about it, he moved his business to Australia. So me and the business had some major restructuring. So the first attempt at a uh, uh, remake of General Chaos kind of fizzled. So finally got everything back going, had enough clients, we're doing this, okay, we're gonna do general chaos, let's restart it. I announced it to the world just before St. Patrick's Day a few years ago, which you know was that, that three week th sickness that happened right after St. Patrick's Day. So we had to stop it again, but we're in the middle of it now, it's, it's coming out, I've got a team of six guys working on it. Um, I should have video up at my booth later of where it's at right now. And come by the booth. Any game I've ever done, and I've done about 90, I've got posters for most of them. Oh, Evil Brow was, the bad guy in Arctic Stud was a brewer who made Evil Brow beer, which was, you found out at the end of the game, was made by the, um, uh, his workers' urine, who were small goblins. Uh, it was their urine that you were drinking. Cow tipping was a game we did for team play here. That was uh, <laughs> just what it looks like. And I made some great shirts for that. 
And I didn't sell those. I'm not sure why no one wanted to wear that on their chest. I still love that one. All right, I'm going to stop here for a sec. Um, I think I am. Actually, I'll just let it run. What I'd like to do is just say, I'd like to open it up for questions. I mean, I can talk about the movie if you guys want to hear about the Rampage movie. That was a blast. Or anything else I've done. So I'm going to take another drink while somebody thinks of a question. I really didn't follow the industry. I was too busy thinking about what I'm doing next. In later years, I realized, I mean, I sold my environmental discs of Tron for a thousand bucks. Okay, so I, I should have paid more industry in, interest into what the industry was doing, but I do have a bunch of my marquees, but, and then a pinball marquees that I had some something to do with. Uh, but no, for the most part, I don't, have any really big collections of anything. My games and that's it. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, I, I was always interested in what I was getting to work on next. Yes? The only game I had, uh, uh, Strange Science by Dan Lang, uh, Langmeyer. Uh, yes, Langloy, I'm sorry, Dan Langloy asked me to do a t-shirt for him one year for Christmas, Santasaurus Rex. And then the next time he had a new game, which was Strange Science, he had me do a, a six-page comic book for it. So that's as close as I've ever got to doing art for pinball games. Anybody else? Yeah. In those days, time frame was about nine months. Spy Hunter took a year and a half, but he was in a little office that management even forgot to keep going back into. I think George Gomez, who's uh, doing Pins of Stern, it was, Spy Hunter was his idea originally. And Tom had a, a, a new hardware that had to be, Tom Leone, the programmer, uh, had a new hardware where he had to figure out a lot of stuff from scratch, because at Bally Midway, we shared everything. Every team, oh, these were Touch Tunes games that I did for the short-lived Touch Tunes bar top system. Every, um, everybody shared everything else at Bally Midway. It was, really was the Wild West. Everybody was, we were all buds. We'd all go out and have our long lunches together and then stay late into the night. I'd sleep on the cot under my desk. But nine months was a typical game back then. Uh, and there would only be two, three people working on it, programmer, an artist or two, a uh, spy hunter, like three artists were working on it, but, uh, and then and a sound guy. That was it. So it was easy. You cranked it out, and you talked all day long. I go to your office. We talk about this. We pull in this guy. We talk about this. Design was wonderful. And for me as an animator, I'm working on, with, on a game for this guy who goes, let's try this. No, that didn't work. Let's try this. No, that didn't work. Let's try. And it's like, I want. I can't, it's not like an art print. I can't take it home and show people what I've been working on. I want it to get out. Or you've got another guy who, um, who does the minimum they ask him to do and then doesn't slide. Uh, so I kind of became a game designer out of self-defense. If I'm work, spending a year working on it or nine months, I want it to get out there. And that was my motivation. And Jeff Nauman, programmer I did a lot of the games with, he was the exact same way. We want to get this out. Ego aside, it's not about ego, it's about, and then when we got bought out by Williams, and I, I think this is kind of common knowledge, completely the opposite thing. Management by design at Williams pitted teams against each other. You did not share things with each other. There were cash bonuses here that, uh, you know, if you can do this like this, so nobody shared stuff with, and they, I mean, I'm not saying it's a, a bad management, because Williams made kick butt games, but it was a, a, it wasn't, wow, this is fun and I get to go here all day, it was more, you know, a different work atmosphere, and it paid off for them, but yeah, I w that's why we only, 
uh, Jeff and I were the only two guy designers they kept when they bought Bally Midway, uh, video game designers, and we left after Pigskin. We left after a game and a half. And I digress. I tend to ramble. You guys may have noticed I tend to ramble. Anything else on any other stuff? Yeah. Good question. I don't have an answer. We're doing it as a PC game first, which I know it can go straight to Xbox if publishers decides. The catch with, I've got the full rights to do the sequel, but the original publisher, EA, still has a right of first offer. I don't think they're gonna act on it. It's not their type of game they're doing right now. Once they say, but if they say yes, they can do anything they want with it, go anywhere they want with it. We're doing it as a PC game. My new CFO has a lot of public, I've got two publishers that are interested in it. If EA says you can do what you want, but they'll have, and then they'll have ultimate say. It's certainly gonna be on PC. If I self-publish, it'll be a PC, Steam, whatever. If, it, if I don't, and we've got a publisher, it's gonna be up to the publisher whether he wants to release it as a PC and, or just, hey, let's set it straight up for this. So I, I wish I had a better answer. Yes. That was mutual. Um, I think George Gomez said it first in a documentary I shot about him or about the industry 20 years ago. So you want to be a video game designer is a documentary you want to watch if you want to see me, Jeff, Eugene Jarvis, uh, Mark Turmel, all the old, um, uh, um, Jack Hager, all the old people at the time when they were much younger and much more willing to say, uh, uh, tell the unfiltered truth about what was going on in the industry and how they got into the industry and what they had to do. It's called So You Want to Be a, a Video Game Designer. It's on the Brian Colon Game Refuge channel on YouTube. But, repeat your question. The, the three player was a money question. It was, we had two customers. The player, who's got to love it and wants to live forever. The operator, who has to pay for it, put it in his store, and wants you off in 30 seconds. We had to make them both happy. So, I mean, actually, excellent question, because the three-player was a natural. Let's get a third guy on here. Didn't have enough art in those, at old hardware, so Ralph is really George in a different color palette with a different head. That's why Ralph was a giant wolf. Um, we, we, things that we could do to get that extra quarter, laughing was my thing. Make them laugh, they're going to put in another quarter. Make them go off the stage naked like they do in Rampage, they're going to laugh. And when they realize if they've got that much time to put in a quarter to keep their score, they're going to dig for that quarter faster. And when the players come up with, oh, he's out down there, let's eat him before he can put in another quarter, they put in any quarters even faster. Arch rivals. It's a time-based game. The time runs out to zero. The game stops, right? No. It stays at zero. No one ever notices until the next shot is taken and the ball stops right there. Then it asks you for your next quarter. Are you going to put in a new quarter to see if you're going to get that uh, thing or not. We had to do things to get players to get the money in, as much money as possible, because that determined how many games were produced. And am I? I'm out of time, guys. Uh, one last question as people are coming in. Otherwise, I'm going to say thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.